Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to SmartCut AI, secure brand specific content generation in any language. My name is Andrew Federici and I'm Vice President of Marketing for SmartCut. Thank you so much for joining us today for the launch of SmartCut's Generative AI Content Creator. Uh, first, let me take you through today's agenda. In a few minutes, um, I'll share a point of view on content in any language, after which you'll hear from three experts from the fields of learning and development, uh, localization and marketing on the hype versus reality as it relates to generative AI. And then SmartCut's product team will demo our new generative AI content creator, which I believe you will find compelling and versatile when it comes to achieving this idea of content in any language. We invite you to participate with questions, thoughts, or comments. Uh, please post them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and we'll make sure to answer them as fast as we can at the end of each segment of the agenda. Great. Uh, for those of you who don't know SmartCat, um, SmartCat is the essential language AI platform for the global enterprise. Next slide, please. The translation industry has been dominated by outsourced service providers, which operate a manual supply chain built on project-based human services. However, this has been changing over many years as enterprise experience missed deadlines, lack of capacity to translate all of the content needed for a global operation, and sometimes within a constrained budget, sometimes running over budget, and the need to constantly redo work that often contains the same mistakes. I would love to see a virtual show of hands if anyone on the on the webinar has experienced any of these challenges in recent times. You can simply uh, click on reactions and uh, put a hand wave or something. Okay, I'm seeing thumbs up from many people. Wow, okay. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and so I'd like to posit um, a change. This sort of, these challenges that we're talking about have accelerated from what we can see due, the, due to the recent proliferation of generative AI. And we see these innovations that are now shining indisputable light on these challenges. And enterprises tell us they can't continue with the status quo because turnaround time is far too long, costs are high, and um, quality is inconsistent due to this manually operated supply chain, which is just prone to errors and repeat mistakes given the way it works. Sound familiar? Perhaps. And so we believe in a world where there's an alternative to the traditionally outsourced method, which delivers the following things, instantaneous results, consistent and continuously improving quality, a solution that can generate savings of 90 plus percent through AI and a simple do-it-yourself application that is fit for any business user. Now to achieve consistent and continuously improving quality, you need to have an enterprise-wide library for all multilingual content that learns from every edit of every corporate user to improve the results and avoid making the same mistake twice. And this library maintains brand voice, keeps terminology consistent, and serves as the basis for generative AI content creation, which is the focus of our topic today. And we believe an embedded workflow 
that automatically sources through AI professional editors and translators from it, a world marketplace when your internal review capacity is filled. This is what we believe in. This is what we've created at SmartCat, and we're so happy to have you today. Before I introduce our distinguished panel, I must show you the latest Gartner Gen AI hype cycle graph. As you can see, we are, according to Gartner, at the peak of what is called inflated expectations. Well, that's why our panel is here, to guide us and give us practical actions to take away that will help us capitalize on this moment. Please allow me to welcome our distinguished panelists and our moderator. David Kelly is the CEO of the Learning Guild. Laszlo Varga is the Chief Content Officer of NIMSI. And Mike Caput is the Chief Content Officer of the Marketing AI Institute. And Coleman Murphy, Marketing of SmartCat, will be moderating the panel. Thank you all so much for attending. And I'll turn it over to our distinguished panelists. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and as Andrew mentioned, AI and generative AI specifically has had a huge impact on business over the last year. Or has it? This really is the question that we're, we're posing to the panelists today. Uh, what has been the actual impact of Gen AI on the day-to-day -day working operations of marketing teams, of learning and development teams, and of localization teams, as well as any other department within the, you know, within the enterprise? Um, so panel, I'm, I'm going to open it up to you uh, to talk to this first. Um, I'm going to get rid of this slide. Feel free to turn on your cameras. So yeah, let's just go around the room. Like let's, let's get really practical here. David, uh, do you want to start with the impact that we've seen with AI in the realm of learning? Sure. Uh, I think, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, and I'm happy to talk about it in the context of L&D. Uh, L&D right now, we're in the point where it's in an experimentation phase. There are a lot of people playing with these tools, seeing what they can do. We're seeing a lot of uh, examples of people. I mean, think about what L&D is. A lot of what L&D does is content creation. Uh, it's an oversimplification of L&D, but a lot of the work that L&D professionals do these days in some way, shape, or form is in the creation of content. So these tools that we've been focused on right now, these generative AI tools, play in that space. Uh, the creation of learning content, the editing of learning content, uh, the organization, but going, even going beyond just the, the core creation of that content, the editing of that content. We're going to talk about the translation of that content during this session. Um, the ability to brainstorm how to, the types of programs you want to have for, for a particular learning initiative, uh, building quizzes. All of these things are things that normally take a lot of time that the use of generative AI is enabling us to do a lot faster, more efficiently. It is not evenly distributed yet. I think we've got um, a, a lot of people who are playing in the space and experimenting with it, but we haven't gotten to that point yet where it has resulted in a fundamental change of expectations of what LND delivers. Right now, we've got a select group of early adopters who are finding ways to do their jobs more efficiently, but I do believe over time that will as it becomes more mainstream, it will fundamentally change expectations in how the work of L&D is done. Fantastic. Thanks, David. Um, Laszlo. Sure. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me to the panel. Very exciting times, no doubt, with large language models. And we at NIMSI, the localization and language industry research and consultancy company, we've been following whatever has been happening in, in the space both with providers, language service providers, language technology providers, as well as on the buyers. And I have to say, um, it's, I'm not going to say it's disappointing, but it seems like it's still waiting for the big breakthrough, which kind of means it's less disruptive um, than in many other industries. The prime reason for that, we believe, uh, from all the discussions that we've been having is these are general purpose tools, and it kind of like you know, like a hammer, give a man a hammer and he will find a nail in everything, right? You can try to do a whole lot of things with large language. They're not purpose-built. You can do 
Now, there are a great many use cases for them. Um, it is still undecided where it's, you know, it's still on court if really there is a return on investment and there are real efficiencies behind it. Not dissimilar to machine translation. For a long time, uh, machine translation, specifically neural machine translation, which by the way is also artificial intelligence per se, um, with MT um, translators have been struggling to say, is it going to help me? Is it going to help me be more efficient? Can I churn out more words, the same language technology providers? Can I offer discounts to our clients or not? By now, we know the technology is mature enough that yes, it can. And of course, one of the primary use cases of large language models in the language industry would be well, translation, because the primary thing that we do is we translate text or speech or whatever it may be. And it turns out, sure, you can translate with them, but we already have really good neural machine translation engines. Why would you use a large language model for translation? That's may, that may be true, but there are so many augmentative capacities of large language models, which just cannot be ignored. And these are being tested and vetted, and um, there are various use cases and various um, organizations who are playing with them. Um, and most of the times we hear either that um, it's in testing mode, we're trying to find out if it's really worth using them, or how to make sure that we get the right quality predictably which is really tricky given it's an AI model, which is inherently has a level of unpredictability in it. Um, or the other thing is the key question that we get is what do others do with it? Right? We want to know what others do with it. And the main activity we see from language technology providers, I have to say, or from technology enabled uh, language service providers. So, so SmartCat, who have been on the NIMSI Technology Atlas for a number of years now um, as a translation management system provider, of course, we expect that you and, and some of your competitors may also be playing with it. And I'm happy to be here at this panel discussing the benefits, and which is part of a lunch event. It's fantastic to be here. Um, looking forward to the rest of the discussion as well as to the questions. Great. Thank you, Laza. Thank you for that perspective. Um, Mike, what are you seeing in the, in the marketing world, you and the marketing AI uh, Institute? You should definitely be very close to all of the, the trends happening there. Yeah, for sure. I think definitely echoing what Laszlo said, we, from a practical perspective, your average marketer is still just getting started with this technology and your average business is still trying to figure out what the use cases are and the ROI. However, I would taking a step back, say that the last year or 10 months or so has been hugely impactful in marketing in terms of the mindset change within the industry. So we've been in this kind of space since formally since about 2016. And this is the first big year where we've really seen a lot of questions and strategy and change come from the top, from your the vast majority of CEOs, CMOs saying, okay, it's time to start figuring out what we're doing with large language models, with generative AI uh, broadly and with AI as a whole. So we're seeing a huge amount of both consumer and just executive level interest in figuring out this technology. But I would say we're very much still in the trying to figure it out phase. Cool. Um, building on that, Mike, just for a moment, do you feel like the people who have now become involved in even this exploration phase do you think that population has changed? I guess this question applies to, to everybody, but let's start with you. Like, is it more execs now? Is it more individual contributors? Who are who are the people who are like most deep in the tools and maybe new to this environment that you were not seeing a couple of years ago or even last year? Yeah, so I can only kind of speak to our, you know, kind of corner of the industry, but we recently released a 2023 state of marketing AI report where we surveyed 900 plus marketing leaders and practitioners about how they're actually understanding and using AI. And we were pleasantly surprised to see that the vast majority, we're talking, you know, 98% or so are using these tools in some way. Now, often that can just be experimenting or dabbling, but we saw it at both the bottom and top of the organization. We saw quite a few executives who were actively trying to integrate these tools into their workflows. And then you also have practitioners who are doing their own experiments kind of in a vacuum in a lot of cases, but while their organizations are still trying to figure this out. So I think it's actually coming from the bottom up and the top down at the same time. And hopefully 
they can start meeting in the middle with some actual formal AI strategies, processes, policies, and guidelines within organizations. Cool. David, any perspective from you? I, I would I would agree um, with what Mike was sharing about the mindset first and foremost. I thought that was a great way to put it. I think that's a really important thing. I think in L and D, we're seeing more from the bottom up. Um, with the, the challenge that L and D has as compared to marketing in, in this particular example, is marketing is seen as selling the product. L and D is generally seen as a cost in a lot of organizations. So L and D is going to be focusing on more of the. Uh, the efficiencies of what we can do. That's that's where a lot of the focus is going to come. And eventually, right now it's bottom up with people experimenting with things in that sort, but it's it's going to start coming from the top as soon as these things start normalizing a little bit more. Um, and that's when that's when we'll start hearing the CEOs kind of saying, all right, how are we doing things more efficiently within our L&D group? And, and that pressure will come in the future. Cool. And Laszlo? Pretty similar observations here, which is to say, over the past few months, the, the discussions changed from, you know, there's this AI thing, what are we going to do with it, to what's our AI strategy, yeah. right? Uh, you can do so many things with it. And it, of course, large language models, sure, but there's also anything from AI video generation to uh, text-to-speech, um, which sounds interesting in many ways. Um, to many of the stakeholders in almost any single department. And that's the interesting piece of it, that everybody's looking at it like, can we do something with it? And who's going to help us figure this out? And it often lands with, you know, the language services, language technology providers, because, well, these are language models, especially the you know, ChatGPT and, and all the rest of them. They, they have the word language in it. So language technology suddenly became the big thing. Uh, we're very happy to hear that in being this um, one of the challenges, of course, is how do we know that it's going to churn out the right quality uh, consistently, as well as what is going to happen to our data? Uh, these are typical questions and challenges, which, you know, if you're talking fast content or you're talking about small, medium business, they may not surface immediately. But on enterprise level, um, at scale, use of these models carries very specific risks, right? uh, which may not be immediately visible. Then again, um, our industry, the language industry, we've been, well, let's put it this way, we've been blessed with neural MT, which is again, um, introduced in what, uh, 2016, 2017 by Google on Google Translate. It's been around. We've been dealing with AI, which is again, one of those places where if um, a new department is heading into something to do with, with language or with content, and now AI is being um, snapped onto it, why don't we go to the language people and talk to them? Because they have been dealing with this, right? Uh, you could say we have the expertise, we have the headway. Um, yeah, happy to help out with um, other departments' challenges as well, and not just the technically the translation and localization. Great, thank you. So one of the other things that we heard early on, um, certainly at, at like the the individual contributor, the bottoms up, the the question was, is this going to take my job? And it kind of feels like that conversation has has moved on. Um, Basla, does that does that mirror what you're hearing, or is that still absolutely a question? That seems to no, no. There's no question about this. We, we believe, at least in in our segment of of, of the industry, um, again reaching back to the neural NT, it already came up with machine translation. Will translators be needed? Will there be business for language service providers? Will even translation management systems be needed because it's all just going to go through MT and everybody's going to be happy with the translation? And it turns out, actually, it helped the industry to grow, right? There are more words being translated than ever before. The majority, of course, is by now uh, through machine translation, kind of invisibly. Mm -hmm. But in general, there is more business for technology and service providers and translators than ever before. AI will not necessarily change this paradigm. We believe that it will not. Rather, what will happen is some of the roles will change. So instead of translating, uh, people will be editing and correcting. It will be more a governance kind of role for the translators and, and language talent and for language programs. Um, and of course, the tools and technologies, not just lang large language models, but anything that is connected to, to content and publishing and translation management, 
they will be supporting a more efficient publishing of content, depending on which content. Again, if it's kind of fast content, go ahead and use AI, right? It's going to add scale, uh, deliver you efficiency. If it's high impact content, mission critical, if it's really driving your revenues, um, or it's about brand engagement, customer experience, have that human at the end of the loop, at least one pair of eyes, right? Which is, again, the same paradigm as with machine translation that has been driving the industry growth. It will happen probably very similarly with um, large language models and AI further down the road. So SmartCats AI content generator will probably also have people looking after it to say, okay, if it's 80% of the time good, how do you know which 20% is not good? And even then the 20% has to be corrected. It's still a human job. Um, and if you want to trust the machine, well, there's only one way of verifying it. Well, actually there are more ways. You can ask a machine to verify a machine, right? Add some more stochasticity into the equation. What are you, what's, what can go wrong? Um, there are use cases where actually checking is, um, is a, um, large language models do a better job at checking than, than generating and creating in the first place. So if you already have content that is similar to the one that you're creating, right? Not use that as a reference, right? Large language models can use a lot of content, but somebody needs to decide which content that will be. It's still going to be governance role somewhere curating the content, which is human and it will stay and will actually help the industry to grow. Awesome. Thank you. And that was, that was actually a, a great segue to the, the second piece, which is now about the last eight minutes or so of, of this uh, conversation, which is the real practical advice that we can give to the people on the, uh, on the event or watching this recording afterwards. So, what I want to hear next from, from Mike, from David, from Laszlo is truly what are the practical things that teams can do within their own organizations, whether that's looking at tools or whether that's, uh, building business cases, um, I want to hear from you on your, your best recommendations for the people on this event, um, for what to do in Q4 and what to prepare for in, uh, in the first half of 2023, as it relates to the, um, you know, the adoption of large language models. And also for people on the call, please feel free to ask any questions, put them in the Q&A. We will have a Q&A session specifically with the panelists right after this on about eight minutes. Um, okay. So Mike, I'm, I'm going to put you on the hot seat. What, what are your, uh, what are your must do's for people in the marketing or extended marketing role in the next nine months? Yeah. So if you have not already, it would be a really wise decision to sit down with your team or just with yourself and in your role, your department, your team, perhaps your entire business, if it's that size of business where you can do this, you need to actually map out what your use cases are for this technology. So it's really great to be experimenting with individual tools. It's great to follow new technology. That's really, really solid. But you're going to quickly find yourself drinking from a fire hose of new technology, possible applications, and it's going to get very overwhelming for a lot of marketers very quickly. Like we hear every day from organizations that are like, how do I actually get started? And the answer to that question is mapping out narrowly defined use cases that have extremely high value to solve and have a high probability of success to solve. So there are a lot of ways to do that, but it really starts by honestly, simple process mapping, sit down and start mapping out what you do in a given day, a week, a month, what have you. And you might just want to start with your own role and start trying to assign just basic values to how much time does that take? How valuable is that thing in terms of your company's goals, your department's goals, et cetera, and then start stack ranking, which use cases again, before AI even comes into this picture, you're not trying to say, what can I use AI for? You're saying, what do we already do? What can we already start uh, making more efficient, making more productive, making more effective should AI at some point be able to come into the equation? So once you have that list, it becomes a little easier to start navigating the vendor landscape to start saying, okay, we've got on this list like three to five use cases that if we solved for these, made them less time or made them better outcomes using AI, this would be transformative. This is really worthwhile us going down a rabbit hole on 
doing demos with certain vendors, uh, investing some money in testing tools, and starting to pilot technology. And you could probably do that, I would say, pretty easily, at least for a limited number of use cases in the next three months or so, and get that mapped out, start exploring the technology, and you can really set yourself up nicely for 2024 with hopefully a couple successes under your belt and some more time freed up to further explore these tools. Great. Thanks, Mike. David. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to what was just shared. Uh, I'll put it in, in the context of L&D in the sense of I think people need to spend the next six to 12 months playing. I think they need to go out and play with these tools, understand what it is, and learn about them themselves. L&D is, is different than other areas of, I think we have an opportunity in, in our organizations where no one's asking us to use these tools yet. They will, but they're not asked. There's not an expectation of doing this because there's not an awareness of the efficiencies yet at the senior level. Once that awareness comes, the questions will come and the expectations will change. And we have an opportunity now to get ahead of it. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll connect my answer to what was shared earlier around this, will AI replace human workers? Uh, I have a little bit more of a, maybe a little bit more of a risk averse answer to this. I don't believe AI is going to replace human, but I do believe humans who can use AI will replace humans who cannot. I do think that that is going to happen in the future. And I think that is very relevant in LFD. I think as, as more and more organizations become aware that the stuff that we did previously that took, you know, 3x amount of time that we can now get through these tools do through x amount of time, that's going to change expectations of how the workflows of L&D go through. And those workflows are going to be built through the use of humans working throughout AI. Yeah. So the question that I normally ask people right now as you're experimenting with these tools, ask yourself the question of if you had 20% of your week suddenly free, what would you do with that time? What's uniquely human about your work that you can add if you suddenly had 20% of your time free? Because it may not necessarily be 20%, but when these tools start becoming mainstream and the efficiencies start to be seen broadly in L&D, there's going to be free time for people. And what are you going to do with that to create value for your organizations? That's the key question that I think L&D professionals are going to need to ask even in the next 12 months. Awesome. Laszlo, do you want to wrap it up and then we'll get into Q&A? Yeah, thanks. I, I, and I fully agree with the book Mike and David just more or less said, which is you can use AI almost immediately to find incremental, um, incremental um, innovations and improvements, right? Can make your work a little bit more efficient, maybe significantly more efficient. But in the long term, it's also important to set aside a time to experiment and just test and have fun with the tools to find something, something that is different, something that is disruptive, something that is out of this world that you would not think of because it's not currently part of your job, but ultimately will drive value for your customers. The prime uh, way of doing this is think through your customer's perspective. What could you do more if you had more time with these tools? Bearing in mind, again, if it's just 80% of the time correct, what kind of risks are you willing to take, right? Um, how risk averse are you or how uh, much your customers tolerate the risks that come with these tools? Uh, which is really a question of a, a very high level decision making even. Um, is the company willing to um, sacrifice part of the brand image maybe? Probably not. Are you willing to sacrifice that some of the customers may, may leave because of it, but you gain 2x customers uh, later down the road? Well, that's probably a risk worth taking. Um, evaluating as to where your levels of risks are is really important. And then you can start talking about out of all the vast array of large language models, which one to start using. Uh, should we do it in-house? Should we just buy tuna models? Should we buy directly from OpenAI or from Google? Um, what's the way of deploying them? But instead of just looking at them and as a hammer and start, you know, hammering at stuff, find the nails that you need to drive in first, right? And then find the hammer. That would be my recommendation as well. But keep playing with it, keep testing it. It's not going to go away. It's going to get better over time. Uh, the different models, maybe the architectures will also improve shortly, even in the next six months, it's very likely impossible. Um, but the core concepts are there. Many of the improvements to these models may also be incremental, 
but they're here to stay in almost any department, language, learning, marketing, whatever it may be. Cool. Okay. I see we've got some questions, but I have one big important question for you guys. Like, feel free to jump in. Budget. Should people be budgeting? money for tools right now to build into their 2024? If so, what should it be? A percentage of a particular department's budget? Some ballpark numbers? I can I can jump in because mine's easy. Uh, I don't think it's necessary for it in the world of L&D right now. The, the tools that most L&D professionals are, are playing with in, in today's environment are either free or very low cost. They don't really have much of a huge budgetary decision, unless they're going with a partner that has got a more mature tool in the, and they're looking for a practical solution, then they should be factoring in. Yeah, I would also say from a marketing perspective, we're probably somewhere in the middle here. Um, if you allocate formal budget to it, it's probably because you're a little further ahead in terms of having identified some of those pilots or even beyond those, hey, what do we want to start scaling? There's not a ton of organizations I've seen personally that are at that phase yet. You know, we're working with some of them to help them get to that phase. And really where even some of the more ahead of the curve organizations are at are starting to structure AI pilot projects and budget around those. But to even get to that point, if you're not there yet, you might not be budgeting yet for that kind of expenditure. However, to David's point, that should not stop you from exploring some of the free or low cost tools. I mean, there's plenty of very powerful technologies, at least in marketing, that you can be experimenting with at, at an individual level or a team level that really shouldn't break the budget, in my opinion. Um, echoing echoing most of that to say, yeah, in localization, you typically would want to set aside time. Um, as well as probably set aside some of the time of your IT counterparts right? um, or your language technology providers. Um, it's the tools to try and test almost free of charge, really. Um, either the free versions or $20 a month. It's peanuts um, in a sense. You do have limitations with it, um, sure. But unless you're a really large enterprise with hordes of data that you could use for fine-tuning or complete retuning of an engine and deploying it on your own servers, you don't really need massive budgets. Great. Cool. All right. Well, thank you. Let's jump into the questions. First one, how do you or will you deal with sensitive information and reply? So, I mean, I could throw out a few ideas here because I know some of the other questions are more specific to localization, which is not, you know, my, the biggest wheelhouse I'm in. But um, in terms of marketing, it's the first question everyone gets is like, what, what should we be thinking about from a compliance perspective, from a legal perspective? Because it is with a lot of the tools and models out there, it's a bit like the wild, wild west. So if you are anyone in charge of or involved in conversations at your organization about how to be deploying this stuff, there should probably be a member or advisor with a legal background or a compliance background involved in, say, whatever AI counsel or informal group you've got together because you will immediately run into those issues. And having those people on your team and involved in the conversation is better than you coming up with some big plan and then suddenly it gets scuttled by legal or by compliance issues. Um, and then just lastly, I would say that's why it's really, really important to even have basic drafts of generative AI policies internally. They don't have to be some big, scary set of laws against or for using generative AI, but you do need to start giving yourself and employees guidance on what these tools can do, what they should and shouldn't be used for, because there's a lot of pitfalls, especially if you're in a more compliant industry. Yeah, not, and I'll add, um, I think the Wild West is perfect narrative for this for where we are right now um, because there are there the rules no one knows what the rules are and we're still figuring that out uh, i can tell you in lnd we've already seen use cases of someone's got a partner's content that they want they're going to build a program with and they want to build learning objectives and things of that sort and the question comes up of well, wait a minute how, what how does that affect my copyright for the material that we got somewhere else don't we don't know the answer to that question 
And I think the bigger question, which is going to come up even more often is, is the tool that you're using to in this generative AI tool, is it using my content to train its model? And for most of the people who are playing in this space, they don't even know what that question means, let alone what the answer. So that that's the heck scary thing in terms of the Wild West is you got people who are playing in a space without a real understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. They, they, they type this stuff into a generative AI tool and this magic happens and these things come in, but they don't necessarily understand everything that's going on behind the scenes and the ramifications could be coming on behind the scenes as it relates to copyright and, and privacy and things of that sort. So that's going to be, I think, again, Wild West is the perfect thing and we've got, we've got to get some rules in place that can give us a little bit more of a solid roadmap on how to use these tools in an effective and safe manner. Yeah, and actually that's that's also one of the things that we're announcing today is a mechanism for dealing with this specific massive challenge, which is I have a lot of content. I I need to maintain it in a secure environment, but I also need to maximize value from that. So uh, please, for those of you in participation and, and watching this, stick around. We're going to be getting into the demo shortly. Um, I know we're we're quite a bit over time here. A lot of the questions are related to language and translation specifically so i think we can copy those at the end yeah maybe i can speak to those each of those in one sentence and then we can jump into the demo and you know later happy to connect on linkedin and wherever and, and answer in more detail but Fantastic. any attempts to create large language models for endangered or low resource languages well the channel challenge here is large language models need a large amount of data and low resource languages don't have a large amount of data ouch but we know that some of the technology providers are already using small um, and custom trained large language models for actual machine translation. So anything is possible in the future as the technology evolves. Uh, the next one is, how do you expect the volume of intervention of a human translator in the near medium term? It will be uh, probably decreasing. Um, some people are already flagging there could be a, a machine translation singularity where MT will be good enough um, uh, to be able to, you know, that is not going to be worth editing it. and to find that one error in a hundred will be like looking for a needle in haste. Um, there was a question about cat tools, MT engines and generative AI merging, or is there an integration? Certainly many language technology providers are doing this. That's why we're here at this event today, right? Um, and anything from machine translation, quality estimation is already something. It's it's a thing in the localization industry. What are the expectations of some online core languages? Not good expectations when it comes to Gen AI at this point of time, unless the, the uh, technology changes kind of significantly even. Does that answer most of the questions, I guess? Happy to talk about them at the level of detail in different forums. Yeah, I think at this point we'll uh, we'll move on to the second section. We'll keep these questions open and we will answer them at the end. Or if we don't get to them at the end, we will make sure they're answered and they're in the Q&A section of the recording, which will be made available to everybody registered for the event or anybody that you want to forward the link to. Um, so with that, I am going to hand it over to Igor on the SmartCat team to talk about what we're announcing today, our generative AI kick. Thank you so much, uh, Coleman, and thanks everybody for uh, joining our webinar today. Coleman, do you mind sharing the slide, the first slide of two of the ones that I prepared? So, SmartCat is the essential language AI platform for the global enterprise. What do we put in these words? This means that we must think not about uh, only translation, something that we started with and what we're good at, but about the entire multilingual content lifecycle, which means creation and adaptation of the content. Translation management systems historically focused on translation workflows alone, and in doing so, catered to translation and localization professionals with sophisticated workflows and tools. SmartCAD changes that. Our goal is to give end users who are not language industry professionals, such as content managers, creators, uh, marketing specialists, uh, copywriters, ability to create quality multilingual content in any shape and form and do so efficiently. So these users think about content creation as a whole. You get a brief, you need to do research, what has been written before, which facts to include, 
Then you write content, reusing and repurposing the previous work. Then you have it reviewed with subject matter experts and then decide how to create language versions of it. Do you need to translate the content or rather create a language specific version of the original copy that is tailored to a different audience or a different market? And after creating that piece of content, you need to publish it or move it to a next stage in your production workflow in the most efficient way. So with today's release of SmartCat AI, we're one step closer to this vision. SmartCat AI makes it easier to reuse your previous content and create new content based on your company's accumulated knowledge. Next slide, please. So how do we do that? Uh, as you already know, SmartCat is a real powerhouse when it comes to working with different document uh, types. We support all popular Office file formats, PDFs, video files, subtitles, and many others. SmartCat also has a number of integrations with content management platforms, knowledge management systems, product information management systems that allow you to send content into SmartCat at scale and then publish the results back. This makes SmartCat a perfect hub that naturally collects all content you translate in all language variants. And SmartCat AI processes this content and makes it available to you when you need to generate something new. Unlike generic systems like ChatGPT, SmartCat is able to provide output based on your company's knowledge, reducing the time it takes to make a quality end result. Just to reiterate, right now SmartCat will process just the documents you send in for translation. In the next iterations, though, we will allow you to upload content into SmartCat for the purpose of storing, indexing, finding, and reusing it. With this, SmartCat will become an enterprise-wide library for all multilingual content that learns from every edit. Same for our integrations. They will allow you to send in your content for indexing, even if you, even if you don't need to translate the entirety of your content. In its first iteration, SmartCat AI offers a chat-like interface that allows you to do certain types of tasks, like generating new content or asking questions about your content. And we are already working on more deeply integrated user experiences. And with that, uh, I would like to hand the mic over to Jean-Luc, who will be demonstrating our SmartCat AI. Thank you, Igor. Uh, Coleman, uh, I will need to share the screen. Correct, perfect, wonderful. You got it. Thank you, Coleman. All right, so I'm assuming that everybody can see my screen right now, and uh, I am logged in into our demo account and for this uh, AI uh, transfer demonstration. As uh, Igor said, you know, and as you, I think you probably understand right now, like SmartCat is really becoming the both the perfect uh, platform for AI and human collaboration. As uh, we uh, described in in the previous presentation, you can translate any documents very easily. Igor mentioned all the different uh, 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 connectors that we have in SmartCat with WordPress, Figma, Zendesk, Contentful, and many others. So we have like a lot of customers that use SmartCat to translate blog posts. They use SmartCat to translate product descriptions, design, LND content, you know. So, but now with SmartCat, not only can you uh, translate your uh, uh, content, but you can also generate new content. And the advantage of SmartCat, this is what Igor was mentioning in a previous uh, presentation, is that the content you generate is going to be based on your own content, content that you've uploaded already into SmartCat. So how does that work? Where really you don't have to really change the way that you work in SmartCat, you know. So you can you can keep on uploading files. Uh, you can upload those files manually, uh, like when you create a new project, or you can upload files using our integrations. When you can just push uh, content automatically, and every single time you add a file into uh, SmartCat, this file will be uh, indexed by our AI for future use. You know. So for example, in this uh, workspace that we're using for the demo. You can see we have a couple of projects that have been created already. And those projects, they contain some internal document. We have our help system uploaded, you know, that's been translated. We also have some blog posts and also some other marketing uh, uh, documents that have been uh, uploaded. Now, when you upload content into SmartCat for working with the uh, AI, you don't have to worry about the uh, format of the document. It can be any of the formats that are supported by uh, SmartCat, you know, like Word files, PDF files, uh, XLIF files, XML, it doesn't matter. You know, as soon as a file is added, 
to uh, to a project in SmartCat is going to be indexed. There is absolutely no need for you to do anything, you know, uh, additional. You know, so that's really uh, simplification of the uh, process. So now is what uh, we're going to do right now. What everybody's waiting for. We can generate some content here. So you can see if you look on my uh, demo workspace, there's a little widget on the right side here uh, that where you can uh, type in your prompt. And we have two different modes. Uh, you have the option to generate content and you can also ask questions, you know. So those are the two modes that we have in the widget. Let's start by generating some content, you know. So we can just have like, you know, a quick, you know, uh, prompt for, uh, for example, we want to uh, find out five reasons to use market to save money on transition via the marketplace and ensure better quality. Just a quick plug on SmartCat here. I'm going to click on enter. And then the uh, we're going to be taken to the uh, to the AI uh, chat uh, uh, interface, where SmartCat is going to present you first some context information. You know, so here you can see, you know, that we're gonna when you add your prompt, we're gonna analyze your prompt. We're gonna uh, uh, find you know uh, content that matches you know the uh, prompt that you've entered right here, and then we're gonna present you some context. This context comes from the documents that you've uploaded. Uh, already into SmartCat. It's not random files and they match the uh, what the prompt is asking for. So here, let's say we're going to pick, you know, a couple of uh, articles here and then you can click on show more and you can find more articles that you want to use for context, you know. So for example, here we have one about machine transition post-editing. This is perfect. This is what I need. And I'm going to click on generate and now the system, you will see you know, right now, what we've done is that the content that I'm using for context is added to my prompt. And this is what SmartCat AI is going to use to generate that new content. And you can see here, now I have like, you know, some uh, uh, content that's being generated, about five competing reasons to use SmartCat for cost-effective, high-quality transition. We're being creative in the content that we create, that we are generating right here. So now, once the system is uh, is finished generating this content, you can keep on working with the system. You can prompt the, the system to, uh, for example, uh, in this case, you know, we're going to wait for the system to generate, you know, the content. You can uh, prompt the system to, for example, summarize those points. You know, you want to take those points. It looks pretty good. And we want to, uh, for example, use them, you know, in a social network, you know. So I could just go in here and say, summarize the above uh, points into five short social media posts with emojis and hashtag. And again, and I'm just going to hit enter and then SmartCat AI is going to generate the content that we want. Now, as you can see, the difference that you have between, this is what I think Igor was outlining, the difference that you have between uh, using a uh, standard uh, 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 generative AI system is that, you know, something like OpenAI, for example, might not have uh, access to your content. But with SmartCat, you can see that all the context information that I've added, you know, as part of the prompt comes from the documents that we have, you know, uploaded into the into the system. If you were to uh, want to process the, the same way, for example, add this context in a, a typical generic uh, a generative, generative AI system, you would have first, you know, store, know where your documents are being stored. You will have to find the relevant documents. You will have to copy and paste, you know, the... Uh, the content, you know, from those documents into your prompt when you write the prompt. With SmartCat, everything is done uh, automatically. You know, you don't have to actually look for the content. You know, we do, like I was saying, we analyze the uh, uh, the prompt that you wrote and then we find in all the documents that you've uploaded the, uh, uh, the content that's uh, matching this prompt that's used for additional context. You know, so we do everything for you. There's no effort needed on your end, you know, uh, and... Uh, and that's really the benefit of the platform, having access to your own content, you know, within, without any additional effort than what you already do for translating documents. Besides gem reading uh, uh, content, as I was mentioning at the beginning, you also have the option to ask questions. And then here, in this case, I'm going to restart the chat. You can see there's a button to restart the chat, and I'm going to ask a question. The question in this case is going to be something that we want to ask, for example, about you know, uh, something that's in our help files, you know, so you want to find something, you know, that's on our help file. You need, for example, in this case, hey, how do I transit PDF files in SmartCat? And here the answers that we're going to generate is going to be based on our own information. You will see, 
you know that uh, right now to translate PDF files with Marcat, you can follow the uh, following steps, and you can see that the information that is generated here is based on the, on the information that we have in the help files. It's not generated by you know a generic you know a, uh, a generative AI uh, system. So you know that the information is going to be appropriate for this uh, for this question. So so this is really a way that you can use uh, a smart cat. You can uh, keep on asking more questions if you wanted to. So for example, I could say I just like you know how to translate you know PDF file. Another question, and this is something if you were you can actually do it. Uh, in your, uh, uh, if you were to use a chat GPT, ask a question like, does SmartCat recognize text and images? You might get information that's not uh, up to date. And you can see here, yes, SmartCat does have the capability to recognize the text in images. And in fact, we did a test, you know, I think with chat GPT when we asked this question and the answer was no, SmartCat doesn't have the capability to recognize text and images. But this, in this case, we have the latest information because this is information that we added you know, to the, uh, to the system. You can also have fun. I think I was just having fun earlier, you know, with, uh, this system, which is like, you know, uh, just a quick uh, demo, of what, uh, like, you know, some creative th things that could be done. I want to generate uh, something here, for example, invite a node to smart words, just something creative, just for fun. And then I just selected, I think just like, you know, a couple, uh, articles, not a lot, you know, but just like, you know, just for fun, as you can see. That you know, SmartCat is going to reach some. It's going to generate something creative about like you know, smart words. And you can see smart words with the key to transition swift and free. You can see, you know, the generated AI is being very creative. You know, but also using our content. You can see it's talking about smart words. It's going to be talking about you know uh, uh, the uh, translations or the gender editor, the different packages that we have in SmartCat, the different subscriptions. You know, so again, we're using information that is uh, uh, absolutely relevant. It's not something that was crawled, you know, uh, three years ago into uh, our website, you know, so. So really this is, uh, the, those are the benefits of the platform. So not only can you now create multilingual uh, content uh, on SmartCat, you can also translate your document, but you can also generate new content and you can do it a lot faster than you would do with uh, regular generative AI uh, systems because you're actually using your own content to generate this content. So it's going to need probably uh, 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 fewer revisions. Uh, you know, it's going to be up to date because all your files are indexed in, in real time. Anyway, that's uh, that's it for the uh, for the demonstration. I think, uh, Coleman, you can take it away from here and maybe we have some questions for Eager. Great. Thank you. Yes, we definitely have questions and... Uh... Again, anybody in the audience, if you have questions, please use that Q&A function and we will attempt to address as many as we can live. Any that we don't, we will make sure we answer those afterwards and we'll share those along with the recording. Um, I, let's work through it. Um, so these, some of these are, are left over from the panel discussion, but uh, I think any, any of our panelists here can answer these. Uh, what's the difference between NLP when talking about AI and NLP in machine translation? Um, Mr. Eager, do you want to take that one? I think these are like di different kind of flavors of AI. Something uh, more traditional, so natural language processing is a part of you know uh, uh, how you deal with with languages. Uh, when we cut, when we uh, usually, and when you know the industry usually talks about AI these days, uh, we talk about large language models uh, and all of the interesting things that they bring to uh, to that industry. So, uh, in the end, the goal is to create new content or translate things naturally. Uh, generative AI allows you to generate more content, obviously while uh, natural language processing are means to support you when you're doing chat, uh, understanding your intent, doing something, um, ultimately translating your content. Okay, we've got one very specific question about uh, AI generator. Will Unite plan clients with access to this AI generator? Um, question go. 
Hold on, I, I will answer okay. one separately directly. So thank you. I um, I answered it already. No, oh, okay. All right, great. Thanks. Um, right. Uh, do you have a process in place where when content is gen where when content is generated, it's then verified? This has been an issue with some other generator tool. I think he could so, probably relate to our to our process of retrieval of mounted generation. I think there are two kind of like sides to that. Um, one side that Jean Luc is uh, you're talking about is about security. What kind of content is being sent uh, for translation? So as you uh, demonstrated, when somebody creates a prompt, a brief uh, to generate some piece of content, we uh, show you as a user the relevant content that you can use. So it's up to you what to send over to uh, our generative AI. And based on that, you can tweak the, the output. But ultimately the next phase when the, the, when the content is generated is for you to review the content. As our panelists said before, uh, generative AI still is not perfect in the sense that it always produces 100% good results. In certain cases, you need to make some tweaks, make some changes. So you as an operator, you as a user are ultimately the one who is reviewing the content. But our goal is to make the content as close to the final result as possible so that you have to do less and less of those edits. Right. Thank you. Next question. The context, i.e. the article that you selected to help generate the new content, can it come from our translated document? I, if we translate a lot of news articles, can I generate a new article based on the ones previously translated? Yeah, the way uh, our system works, it analyzes your source documents and we're working on analyzing targets as well. So you should be able to generate your content not only based on the source documents, but uh, also based on verified translations that you have. And uh, a variation on that, to be clear, do the results generated come only from audits being previously updated, indexed in previous MarkCat project? Yes, yes. Uh, right now we're, uh, you know, indexing all of the content that comes uh, through SmartCat. So, uh, and by the way, not only translated. So even if right now, if you put some document into SmartCat, but do not translate it just yet. We'll be already indexing the source document and we'll be reusing that for content generation. So technically you can put some of the content without translating it and it will still be used for AI generation. And as I mentioned previously, when talking about uh, you know our vision in general, we're working on a way for you to upload the content just for the purpose of you know, indexing and finding it and not for the purpose of translation. So there will be a way for you to just upload some uh, previously existed documents and they will be uh, counted into equation when it comes to generating new content. Great. Um, I see we're at time. We will keep the session open and we can uh, continue to talk through these questions and answers. If you need to drop, just go ahead and drop. As I said, the recording will be made available after this event. We will also be sharing all of the Q&A. Once again, thank you to all of our panelists uh, and to all of the SmartCat team for joining. Again, if you want to stick around, we'll stay online until we get through these last few questions. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll see you at a future event. Okay, so one other question, again, related to content. If I have a new client, but I do not have any previous translations from them? Can they send me their previous file? I upload them and use that as a reference. The answer is yes. yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, are there, uh, there was a question about languages. Is SmartCat AI Assistant available in other languages? Yes, it's, it's language agnostic, uh, thanks to technology behind the hood. So if you upload, for example, Spanish documents as a source, we'll be already indexing them and you can ask SmartGuard AI in Spanish and give in, you know, have the Spanish help them. And also the UI itself will be in multiple languages, right? 
yeah, smart cat UI is available in a handful of languages. Okay. Uh, is there a possibility to create a project with the generated content right out of chat? Does it need to be moved? Yeah, right now uh, you have to do this manually. So something that we didn't demonstrate, but you probably saw that on the screen, when uh, the piece of content is generated, you can copy that or you can download it as a file and then immediately upload that file into a project if you want to have uh, that content translated. You can also also uh, ask uh, SmartCat AI to translate the content for you and will uh, produce the uh, like result of the last message in different language. So that's also possible if you just need something very quick. Um, what we plan to do in the future is next steps uh, is to more deeply integrate that into your workflows. So from the generated piece to the ability to alter the content, so edit it online, to translate, to alter the output. That's something that we are working on, but our goal was to give that technology uh, for you guys as soon as possible to make sure that you can play uh, around with it so you can uh, bring us more feedback and this will inform our next steps. Really good question here from Hans Petter. Uh, I'm part of a bigger organization. When people are using SmartCAD, will all of the information and content be combined when I put in a prompt or will the outcome be just based on? my input or implied my project or work state. So though uh, it'll work is as follows. In SmartCat, you can have multiple workspaces. Those workspaces, in those workspaces, you can have content that will be used for content generation in uh, SmartCat AI. We actually absorb all of the content from your organization and can show you that, uh, to you that as a context there's a way to opt out of that. So if a specific workspace is related to some sensitive materials, some some legal stuff, there's a way to opt out of indexing that for content generation. But the entirety of your organization's content by default should be available to you. Now, it's your choice whether to use certain pieces of content. Uh, we help you surface that content, even, even if it was uh, uploaded by someone else. And as you select what needs to be uh, become a part of that, you know, generation prompt, uh, you select those items, and they will be used for generation. Great. Uh, any plans to add voice over translation or multilingual voiceover for videos? Yes, we're working on it. It's too early to give you all the details, but that's something that we consider a crucial part of our platform. Okay, cool. And I've saved, I've saved this one question for last because I think it's a, it's a great summarizing question. It's like, what can AI help smart cat users now do in their daily translation slash editing project? So apart from uh, content generation that we uh, demonstrated today, there are other uh, places where smart cat AI shows up in our UI. For example, you can use uh, generative uh, translation as a translation engine to automatically pre-translate your content. And that allows you to, again, move much quicker to deliver the final results. You can also go into the editor and use so-called AI actions. These are like snippets that, again, are configurable that allow you to do some transformations to your text. You can shorten your text. You can rephrase it. You can make it simpler to digest. You can uh, change it so that, you know, uh, the speech comes from a like, female or male perspective. So all those uh, things are available through our reactions, which is you know, the interactive way of you know, working with translations. Great. Thank you. All right, Andrew, I'll hand it back to you to take a sec. Thank you so much to everyone for joining today's session. Thank you to our distinguished panelists, um, David Kelly, Laszlo Varga, and Mike Caput, and also to Igor and Jaluk and Coleman. Um, uh, thank you so much for attending, and um, please feel free to reach out directly uh, to me, Andrew, at smartgut.ai for any other questions or um, thoughts or uh, 
things you might want to discuss. Uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you uh, at a future event and uh, to helping us move forward in the language uh, AI trajectory. Thank you so much.